Oh, and John Claude, just sort of off the record, I was telling John about this sort of insane thing that happened last night. So I met this girl on Bumble, which is like a matchmaking app. It's so much better than Tinder because girls have to reply first or else the conversation <laughs> expires. So anyways, I'm talking to this girl and she's like, hey, do you got a Skype? And I'm like, yeah, dude, we'll totally Skype. That's a good next step after the Bumble. So I'm Skyping her and we're talking and she's like, hey, do you uh, mess around on here? Oh. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> And she takes off her shirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she starts going to town. Oh my. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I just went, oh my. Oh my friend Gage is gonna talk. Talk to you. Oh, and jump off. Fucking, it's almost adults. Shit. Almost adults. Shit. The question was, how many times has a girl come up to you to, like, initiate, like, here's my number? Uh -huh. A good zero times. Yeah, I, well, I was like, maybe a handful, like, mm -hmm. at the bar, if somebody's, like, really drunk or something like that. But all of that pales in comparison to, like, a girl being like, do you want to Skype? And now I'm just naked in front of you. <laughs> you know what I Absolutely. mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, she took off her shirt. And I'm like, oh. And she's like, do you want me to get naked? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> That's what gets engaged. The nonchalantness, <laughs> you showing no distinct eagerness. That's what does it. Yeah. And it's weird, because I've never had the sex before. I don't know if you guys know. I mean, I feel like you would have told the story yeah. or something. I gleaned from the love cast. Oh, yeah. That's a very honest portrayal. I would like to do another love cast. Yeah. With, like, a totally different cast, sans Jean-Claude and I. Oh, okay. As long as you somewhere implant Wait. that story, somewhere in the mix, even if you're not in the actual episode. Yeah, I'll totally tell that story. Wait, when you say a new cast, sans Jean-Claude and you, do you mean... An entirely new cast? Oh, no. I'm saying that it's Jean-Claude and I and three new people. Okay, so the exclusion is sans Jean-Claude and Gage. Yes. Got it. Okay, uh, yeah. I was confused as well. It's a double negative. It is. Clever. I'd get naked for you. Thanks, man. Now I kind of want to. It's like I'm, I'm a little bit jealous. Go to Bumble, man. Go to Bumble. Go to Bumble. <laughs> Just switch the setting to guys and look for Gage. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's what she typed out. Yeah, you just set your filter to, to guys living in L.A. And then you'll find <laughs> Gage and just strip for him. Final question, I guess, for it. So, obviously, there was video. Was there audio or was it just like type, 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 watch, 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 type, type, type? There was audio on my end, not on hers. So she says, her mic was broken. I think I would have heard her. At least like ambient sounds, yeah. Yeah. Do you guys ever like in, in high school chat roulette? Oh, yeah. I think John and I did that together. Yeah. yeah. It was like you, me, Dodge, that gang doing chat roulette yeah. in like Van's living room. The house on Sunset. Yeah. Yeah. That you got some. I mean, mostly it was just penises, but but still every once in a while you'd get some. <laughs> you get some gems. <laughs> I think it really says something about dudes that are like. Lonely? Yeah, dude, the chat roulette, like that was really tight because you had a chance of seeing some boobs. Boobs. Even though like a thousand percent of it was all dicks. Yep. <laughs> it was <Yeah>. all dicks. <laughs> but like there was a chance. I like your right? ratio. A chance. Your ratio is like, okay, a thousand percent dicks. But maybe, just maybe, <laughs> there's some boobs. That is 100% <laughs> true. And it is that drive. Yeah. You just be like, okay. I don't remember what the button was to go to the next one. I don't know if it was a shift or enter or space bar or something. Yeah. And just click the button over and over and refresh. Where uh. the boobs? Where the boobs? I could Google them, but I need to know the real boobs. And it would tell you, like, you're chatting with someone from Chattanooga or something. Do they chat up roulette a lot mm. in Chattanooga? I don't uh, Oh, yeah. Maybe that was subliminal. But even even worse than just the copious amount of dicks was, like, the not as rare as boobs, but still kind of rare time that you would, like, pop into some slightly older than middle-aged guy that's just, like, in his brightly lit living room staring at his computer and <laughs> it's just like, you know why he's there. Why? Because he's just creeping. Oh, he's yeah. He's a creepy old dude. <laughs> that went over my head for a hot second. By the way, welcome to Almost Adults. Oh, yes. Welcome. <laughs> We're talking about dicks. We're talking about boobs. We're talking about old men in their brightly lit living room. It's going to be quite an episode. <laughs> we got John it's Schmick aesthetic. over here. Hello. John Schmick, everybody. Hello. John Schmick, everybody. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you. I'm very honored. I'm very excited. I think you guys should know I'm definitely going to be drinking during the show. Not a problem. That is perfectly acceptable. I don't I don't know there, if there's been an episode where Gage and I have, have drank. It should also be an episode. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking about doing that near St. Patty's Day, but it just kind of came and went. That's right. St. Patrick's Day already passed. Damn. Yeah. I just think you should drink every day. By the way, as of recording this podcast, yeah. we've been doing almost adults for a year. Ooh, what? Woo! Yeah. Oh, now I have a bonus reason to drink. Here's to 80 more years. <laughs> more like 80 more yeah. months, if you know what I mean. 80, 80 more years. In the last couple episodes, all you hear is just the, the sounds of beeps. You're just like, the doot, doot. There's no talking. We're just going through chat roulette. <laughs> oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah, we were talking about chat roulette and how there's a thousand percent of dicks on there. But maybe, just mm. maybe, we'll see some boobs. Exactly. It is, it is a perfect exactly. metaphor for that sexual drive, that, that club drive. I was listening to Conan with Anna Ferris, and she used to do chat roulette a lot. Mm -hmm. She didn't show her boobs, disclaimer, because she's married to Chris Pratt, and why is that necessary when you're married to Chris Pratt? I Anyways, agree. <laughs> she just goes on with her friends, and whenever she sees someone masturbating, she starts cheering them on. She's like, you can do it! <laughs> what? I really like the image of someone skipping it like, fuck! Wait, was that the chick from Scary Movie? Oh! Okay, you said her name, and I, okay. That is definitely the chick from Scary Movie. I didn't realize she was married to Chris Pratt. I knew he was married. Yeah. That is a lovely I, couple. Yeah, I actually just had to Google her. She's also on the Warner Brothers lot because she's filming Mom right now with Alice and Janney, and she has a very successful podcast herself. I bet. I bet. Yeah, because she brings all the Avengers on. Why wouldn't she? That's like, you're cornering a market like that. Which is like, come on, 90% of people watch those movies. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We should dive into our topics today. We should. Okay, let's go for it. Because we did actually write down some topics. So, oh John. Boy. Oh, boy. You had a very interesting thing. I don't talk to you too, too often. But when I do, you say how much of a fan you are of almost adults. This is true, right? That is true. Uh-oh. Yeah, Silence. I listen to a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> The reason I've deduced you're a fan of Almost Adults is that you have gone through, I don't think John Claude knows this, but you've gone through most episodes and you've written down what you would like to add to our episodes if you were on. Really? I have a short list with me, yeah. Yeah, I have a short list right now. Oh, man. Um, so we are going through memory lane. Yeah, yeah. So let me let me pull up my iPhone notes. That is probably the most, I don't know, heartwarming or it just makes me smile. That's, that's a pretty cool compliment. John claude you don't get a lot of the fan interactions. It mostly goes through me because I run the Twitter and the Instagram and the email. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm amazed what people do with this podcast. I still don't know that we have fans. I assume we're pretty anonymous, but apparently not. There's some mumblings about us. Ooh. Which is nice. Very yeah. niche and loyal following, maybe. I appreciate being mumbled about. So the love cast. Yes. There's a question, or like one of the threads was, what was your first date like? Mm -hmm. Or like your first kiss? Something like that. Did they go hand in hand with you? No, well, like, I don't know. I have gone on like actual dates where like I... I like... <laughs> Sorry, that sounded so condescending. No, but I completely understand what he means because nowadays uh, the word date means like, oh, she came over, I made her some pancakes for dinner, and we watched Game of Thrones. Mm. Exactly. Sounds like an excellent time to me. That's what I did when I first started dating Sarah. That was our first date. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah. So like, I think I was 15, something like mm -hmm. that. And so I was at this other girl's house, like a, a third party kind of friend. And I had like kind of been talking to this girl, Ashley, for a while. And she was a grade above me. And Ashley was about to leave. What grade were you in? I was a freshman in high school at this point. Ooh. Okay. Yeah, Ashley was about to leave. I kind of like did this really awkward walk her to like the garage door because I didn't really know what to do. And I awkwardly went to like kind of give her a hug and she like put her face in front of mine and we just kind of, it wasn't a headbutt or a kiss. You just kind of ran into yeah, it. Yeah, it was like the weirdest, like have you seen that gif of the manatee that can't stop before it runs into the wall? It was just like that, right? <laughs> like we just kind of like smushed into each other. <laughs> I'm unfamiliar with these gifts. I'll send it to you in a minute. It's atrocious, right? So like, it was weird because like, that was my first kiss and it was not elegant. It wasn't really satisfying mm. by any means. Like she left and I was like, 
uh, wait, was that? <laughs> was that it? Oh, gee. Yeah, like, I think I should be happy, but I don't feel like I really accomplished something right now. Like, that was unfortunate. <laughs> I'm curious how she felt about it. I don't know. Like, I was kind of intimidated because she was a grade older than me. Like, I always just kind of felt like everyone is, like, more acclimated and used to these things than I am. Yeah. So like on the GamerCast episode, it was the, like the first or second one you guys had with Carlo. I think, I think that's our uh, third episode ever. Yes, the third one. Because it wasn't the Mario and Sonic one, right? No, it was that one. It okay. Was that okay, one. all right. Never mind. Go on. So you guys were talking about how you feel towards anime. And like mm-hmm. Carlos was kind of saying like when he was a kid, anime was like his thing. Like he would stay inside on Saturday nights to like watch Toonami. Yeah. And like he hated like anime as everyone's kind of thing and whatever. I guess I don't really care that a lot of people watch anime, but I have a problem that a lot of people watch anime in the right kind of way. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Yes, I, I actually do kind of know what you mean. I don't know what you mean. I want you to elaborate on that. I don't follow. So like when Dragon Ball Z was first coming out, mm-hmm. I would watch like every episode and like rewatch it and I would like go on to uh, like Google wasn't a big thing, but it was like kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. And so I'd find like really awful forum boards to find other people like cataloging various Dragon Ball Z moves and I was like oh this is it like (laughs) my life became Dragon Ball Z you know what I mean Mm -hmm. and I was like oh yeah here's like all the various Kais and like here's the relation to each other and like some of the mythology and stuff and I feel like the people that I've talked to now that will like start watching something like Attack on Titan, they'll like watch the one season or the two seasons and be like, oh yeah, I love that show. Like there's the big guys with no skin and like they're so scary, but like they don't like emotionally get involved in the show. I don't like that. Like dig into your stuff. Oh, in that same episode, you guys were talking about the train mission and San Andreas. Uh, yeah. All you gotta do you gotta is follow the- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, dude, like my thing, like confession, I did not mind that train mission, but I fucking hated where you had to fly the RC helicopter around and like pick up the bombs. That was like the worst thing oh I could ever like deal God. with. Oh God. Ever. That's just a broken ass game right there, San Andreas. It was kind of broken, but I also, mm-hmm. I guess, pushed that RC thing out of my mind. Oh, jeez. I don't think I got that far in the game. It wrecked me. It wrecked me real bad like. I also <laughs> real bad I remember hating the mission where you sneak into some rapper's house and you have to steal his rhyme book for the guy that works at the burger place. Oh, I do remember that one. I yeah, do remember yeah. that one. And, and you you had to like stab people. I'm just like, I just want to blow shit up, dude. Yeah. For some mm. reason, those games, they just have a need to put in every little gadget that they can so like stealth elements that they have to implement and just doesn't work for that it's not built around that so it just ends up being janky as fuck because that's the game's greatest strength being able to do whatever you want and once you put restrictions on that it makes the game less fun yeah now that i say that that's pretty basic 101 game design wait were people what you said like once you put restrictions on things then it becomes less fun yeah, if the game's centered around being able to do what you want in your own way, uh-huh. and once you put restrictions on that, then you're kind of messing with the core of the game. Oh, I completely disagree, but that's a, that's an argument for another gaming episode. Shelf that. <laughs> oh, yeah, we yeah. haven't had a gaming yeah. episode in like a yeah. year. Yeah. I played Zelda Breath of the Wild, and what was the other one? Shovel Knight. I think those are the only two games I play. Oh, no, and Pokemon Sun and Moon. Those are the three games that I've played probably the most. Out of how long? Well, in this past year. Oh, uh, true. Yeah. I bought and beat Saints Row 3 and 4 in like a weekend. Oh, man. Like I dumped like 40 hours into those two games. Like 40 or 50 hours into those two games. That's amazing. That's what Carlos would do. Oh, yeah. Carlos would finish up a project or he'd have a big project in school and he'd finish it. And so he'd have like a week off with no stress kind of projects or any deadlines or anything like that they had to worry about. So he'd come home from class. Oh, yeah. if he had class that day and he'd just hole himself up in his room for a whole weekend or like a couple days. And he'd just knock out games hour after hour after hour after hour after hour. And he did the same thing with Saints Row and it was scary. I don't know. I couldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. knocked on his door and you're like, Carlos, are you all right? And then he went. <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly. I know Carlos too well, but go on, John. Oh, the episode that you guys did with Colleen, mm-hmm. she was asking John Claude about. Um, well, actually, I don't know if Colleen asked it, but like somehow the conversation became like John Claude like going through the master's program. Mm-hmm. It was you talking about seeing other students really invest all of their time into the studies and not really spending a lot of time like 
I don't know, socializing <laughs> or just kind of like exploring the world and stuff. But like, so currently I'm doing a master's myself. I have experienced the same exact thing that you're talking about. Oh yeah. And like nobody in the program wants to like get together and hang out and like go drink beers and just kind of fuck off and do stuff. And so like, I feel myself experiencing that tension that you witnessed of like, all I do is I'm here and I'm studying, but I don't feel like I'm really living. I don't like that. I don't want to be that kind of person. And it's really making me second guess, like doing a PhD or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like I'd rather just kind of work at a cafe. Absolutely. I mean, I don't know. I found myself, I would come home and just sit in front of my computer all day, just studying. I wouldn't get a lot of sun. Now I'm doing a lot of improv, so I'm socializing practically every night of the week. I work during the day, so even though I kind of just do random tasks here and there, I'm still interacting with a lot of people during the day, and I just, I don't know, just, I, I completely feel you in that respect, and I'm, <sighs> I guess it's, it's hard, and I, I hate that the education system has turned into this thing where it's every man for himself, and you are expected to cut yourself off from any sort of interaction. Like, people will literally say on, on test weeks or, or something when they have a deadline, they'll be like, okay, they'll post on Facebook or something. I like, I won't be answering any phone calls or talking to anyone for the next week. All right, I'll sign off. See you guys later. And then nothing. It's, yeah. It's scary. It, it, exactly. Wow, you're like opening up old wounds, my friend. Not old wounds, but like hey. old memories, I should say. Yeah, they're a little bit of old wounds. I'm happier where I am right now. So one other thing, Engage, you might also have something to say about this, having moved out to LA and like trying to make your own lane and stuff is like, I had read about and like seen YouTube videos and like TED talks about the imposter syndrome. If you guys are familiar with that. Mm -hmm. I am not. Well, I, it's really like what I've experienced. And I wonder if you and John claude had, it's where you feel like you don't really belong where you are. Like you kind of like got there by a mistake. Mm -hmm. You slipped through the crack or something like that. I like started this master's program. I'm doing a master's in philosophy. And so I would like talk to the other students and like be around like the PhD students and stuff like that. And I started like have this growing feeling of like, I have not read Kant. I don't know Hegel. Like I've never really read Hume. I, I don't know Nietzsche well enough. I don't know Plato. I haven't really read Aristotle. Like. I don't belong here. I should just go home. I'm wasting their time. And like, I'm not a super overly confident or like very self-assured person, but like I've never experienced a radical self-doubt to the core of just, I don't belong in this kind of situation. I guess I'm kind of curious if Jean-Claude, like if you had a similar kind of thing in your master's program and if Gage had a thing, when Gage moved out to LA, and it's like trying to kind of make his way and stuff like that. Oh, definitely. I mean, I experienced that during my master's program, but that's also a really common issue that I deal with in, in pretty much all regards uh, of my life. When it came to like animation or even recently, someone hired me to do a quick film project where I just, I'd just be surveying a construction site and just filming things for them and they'd pay me it. And I got there and I was filming the stuff and it was just the feeling of why are they paying me to do this? I should just tell them that I'll just do it pro bono because I'm not qualified to do this. You know, I didn't study any of this. And when they see the final product, they're going to realize that I'm just kind of a schmuck, not a schmick. A exactly. Schmuck. Yeah, I deal with that a lot and it's hard. I tend to really undersell myself in the end because I doubt my qualifications for things. I feel oh, yeah. the exact same way. Every time I'm on a film set or I'm podcasting with someone or I'm meeting up with someone that I really admire, what's constantly going through my head is like, I fucking shouldn't be here. I haven't reached that level yet. Mm -hmm. Even doing this podcast or like being on sets that I really like. Hell, even being on the WB lot, I sometimes feel like I shouldn't even be here. But hey, you just got to fake it till you make it, man. Yeah. And I think what's weird is like a lot of the advice I'd heard from like YouTube videos and just talking to like other students and faculty was that exact same line of just fake it until you make it. You know, like none of them really think they should be here until they feel like they should be here. I feel sort of the exact same. I remember actually when I was in London, I feel like I referenced this too much, but I actually had a conversation with Brian Wecht about it because I was having kind of trouble with confidence at that time. And I'm like, hey, I'm having sort of trouble being sort of this confident guy and kind of owning what I like. And he's like, yeah, I had the exact same thing. And I just decided to try to be that guy who I was, even though I didn't feel like that guy. And then one day I kept doing it till I really was that guy. That's actually one of the qualities that 
Gage, I, I know you've spoken with Alex, but neither of you have actually, I don't, I don't think, actually met Alex. John, I have John, you might have, because he came to one of your house parties one time. So it might have been like a brief chance meeting. But anyways, I was probably too drunk. Exactly. I think we all kind of were. <laughs> so I have a friend named Alex, and we're currently working in the same office and for the longest time from the beginning this kid has been totally cool in his own skin or at least it seems that way and he has zero problems right out of the gate when he meets a new person like making it clear what his interests are that like he has no qualms about letting them know like oh man i'm, I'm a big comic book nerd and like i love cosplaying like anime i love one piece naruto all this kind of stuff and he'll just go at it and he'll talk about it and he'll be super like i don't know for me sometimes those are guilty pleasures Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's not always socially acceptable to like geek out on those kind of things and sometimes some people will think it's weird like oh he's just a big old nerd but he's always been comfortable in his skin for example tomorrow's my birthday and so today in the office i come in and he told me the day before to wear my spider-man shirt and so i come in and here's this kid he's like completely covered the wall and like happy birthday spider-man stuff and there's donuts <laughs> there and he's like standing behind the doorway when i walk in dressed in full spider-man costume with like a big confetti popper <laughs> and like oh all of his office mates are just like laughing hysterically because he's in this Spider-Man costume and like, first of all, his dong is like clearly visible in his skin tight costume. Awesome. But, <laughs> but you can tell that all of his office mates like just love this kid. He's part of the family yeah. there and they, I don't know, I respect that quality so, so much if you're just comfortable in your own skin. You don't short sell yourself, sell, sell yourself short. Sell yourself short. Yeah, in yeah. those regards. But it's hard. It's a hard thing to do. But it is kind of comforting that it's not just me kind of struggling with that, you know? Mm -hmm. It's pretty much everybody. It was not comforting for me to know other people dealt with it. Really? To, to be honest, like, I guess I, I just kind of thought, like, if you get shot in the leg and I get shot in the leg, I don't feel better because I know that you're also in pain, right? Like, I just feel awful and I kind of feel bad that you also feel awful. It was just like a really downward spiral kind of thing. I don't know, like it, eventually it just kind of like, it's not necessarily like I feel like I belong right now, but I've almost just kind of become ambivalent to it. And I'm just kind of like, hey, if you guys haven't caught me, then <laughs> you haven't caught me, I'm allowed to stay. Like, yeah. And I'll just stay here for another few months and get my degree and I'm done. Like, but yeah, so that, that's my list of things. Oh, on that same topic, real, real quick. For me, it's comforting to know that these people have these problems uh, because they're people I, I'm going to sound so kiss-assy, but I look up to people like John and Jean-Claude and it's comforting to know that they're going through the same thing, even though in my eyes, I feel like they're doing super well. I feel like both of you guys are very social. Mm. I feel like you guys kind of know what you want and are comfortable with the things you like. Mm. You are mistaken, but it's <laughs> nice <laughs> to hear. You're fucking wrong, but you know, that's great. Whatever. But it, yeah. it's definitely, I feel like yeah. that's a very like, philosophical perspective, John, in, in regards to where, like, the way you said that you hurt almost even more knowing that you have shared pain like this is almost like a ubiquitous kind of feeling that's among people. I don't know. Well, most yeah. people I would think, oh, it's almost the phrase like misery loves company. And I think mm -hmm. the kind of like, oh, the other person is going through the same thing I'm going through. Oh, that's kind of comforting. You know, that's, we, we share something similar, but I found that really interesting. It's an interesting take to like, oh man, I feel even worse that he's he's got to go through what I'm going through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's all garbage. All of life is garbage. I don't know. I, I didn't really understand the times people would say something like, you know, somebody else is worse off than you. And I guess I would just kind of think like, yeah, they might be, but like, I'm still in a bad spot, mm. right? Like me knowing there's a homeless guy doesn't make me feel better about not being able to pay rent. I still can't pay rent. Um, yeah. Anyways, yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of making it through school and trying to watch a whole lot of Netflix and that's it. It's a good life. What are you watching on Netflix? Actually, I'm working my way through the old Kung Fu movies currently. Oh man, have you seen Legend of the Drunken Master? Yeah. Oh, oh my yeah. god. It's a Jackie Chan one, yeah? Yeah, That's it's a Jackie Chan. Classic. Really, really good. I think there's two endings to that, right? I think in the American version it gets cut off, and like he wins the fight and everything's good and done, but I think in the original Chinese one, they cut out the part where Jackie goes blind after drinking all that crazy amount of alcohol at the end. Oh, I like that ending better. Yeah. <laughs> It's better, it's deeper. Well, there's an episode where like he goes through the 12 steps and just becomes like a regular master. 
Oh, really? Yeah, that's the tuxedo. Oh, yeah. I yeah, like the tuxedo. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm solo in that, but I really like the tuxedo. Tuxedo is a fun movie. I'm not bashing it. It's just a funny movie title name, the tuxedo. It's like a mixture between Jackie Chan and that Johnny English movie. Yeah. <laughs> what other uh, old kung fu movies are on there? Last night I watched The Five Venoms, which is a beautiful work of art if you guys get a chance to watch it. Oh yeah, dude. I mean, it's not really a kung fu movie, but the um, phase four about like the alien ants. Have either of you seen that? No. That sounds awesome. I have not. Oh, dude, it's so great. It's like, it's not really campy. Like, I think they were trying to make like an actually kind of scary movie that's like eerie. But yeah, it's these two guys in the desert trying to study like this very bizarre ant colony thing. Mm -hmm because there's ants of different species working together and that's not supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. And so they go out to study this ant, or the, like the colony, and end up in a war with the ants. And it's riveting. It's freaking riveting, I'm telling you. Oh man. Especially because like, you just kind of think to yourself like, yeah, okay, even if the ants start to attack me, I can just like walk away. I'm like 80,000 times bigger. <laughs> yeah, I'll just, I'll just walk away from them. But the strength in numbers. <laughs> yeah, like it's, <laughs> it's so weird being like, oh yeah, I guess enough ants can just take down, you know, a, a high tech science facility. So if you have a chance to watch phase four, it's real choice. I also really like the Stephen Chow movies. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Stephen Chow? Yes. Uh, he did uh, Shaolin Soccer, Kung Fu oh, Hustle. Oh, okay. All right. I didn't know who directed it, but I do know Kung those Fu movies. Hustle. Yeah. Yeah. He also did uh, Journey to the West with the Monkey King. I don't think it's on Netflix oh, anymore. Oh, wait, wait a minute. No, it came out recently, right? Not recently, like 2010. Right, I feel like that's pretty recent in terms of like Kung Fu movies. I guess, like, kung fu is not, like, the biggest genre, I guess. It's the only one that matters. <laughs> what about zombie movies? Hmm? Uh, I know you like I, zombie movies, Schmeck. Yeah, so, like, here's the thing, right? One of the very first classes that I took at FSU, it was me and David Mizell, and it was philosophy of film through zombies. Whoa. But that's what I'm saying, right? In this class, we watched a whole bunch of zombie movies and, like, read all of these articles about different types of zombies and philosophical problems with zombies and what does it mean to be a zombie and X, Y, and Z. And since then, it's been difficult for me to watch anything zombie-related and not, like, fall into, like, this thought dark hole kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm. I'll just get trapped in like, yeah, but like, what kind of zombie are you? Is that a virus? Is it like a pathogen? Is it an alien species thing? Is this supernatural? Is it X, Y, and Z? Like, so it's become difficult for me to like casually enjoy those shows. Ah, uh, okay. I finally stopped Walking Dead, so that's good. You just now stopped watching it? I know, I know. I was like seven years in deep. And then I just got so bored and I'm like, goodbye. And people are like, I stopped in season two. And I'm like, okay. Well, you wasted less of your life than that. <laughs> that's, the, that's the homeless guy syndrome right there. They may have stopped their suffering, but it yeah. changed what you had to go through. Yep. I like the homeless guy setup. I know that's not the name for it, but that's yeah. the new name for us. Definitely that. Especially when it's applied to, like, who stopped watching the TV series <laughs> <Exactly>. first. <laughs> People are like, I stopped watching The Office after Steve Carell left. And I'm like, oh. Well, you don't know. Yeah. Oh, Same thing with fucking Scrubs. Yeah. Wait, you don't like The Office after Steve Carell left? No. No? Who does? I liked it. Did you stop uh, watching it after Steve Yeah, Crow? Gage, you're wrong. No, I watched all of it. Oh. Oh, man. The only good episode was the finale, the series finale. Oh, wait, was it the episode before that Dwight got married? That was the finale. That was the finale? Okay. Because he comes the finale, back. Yeah. And I was just like, Gah! but I loved it. I loved the whole Jim, Pam, angry at each other. I feel mm. like they kind of dropped the ball in terms of the, the sound guy kind of deal. Yeah, I thought yeah. the sound guy thing was ham handed. Really? Yeah, like, he's like, oh, he was here the whole time. There's this whole relationship between them. And I'm like, what, 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 wait, wait, what? Slow down? Yeah, I, most, I mostly just mean, like, they kind of introduced it, regardless of how hammy it was when they introduced it. They did introduce it, and then they just kind of let it go without any repercussions. I feel like Jim should have found out about that whole thing going on. I don't think they ever did. I don't think they ever... Did they address it? I don't feel like they did. See, you can't even remember. Well, no, but but like for the sound guy thing, I just kind of saw that as a, a tip of the hat towards just how regular it is for um, fidelity and relationships to just be tested by small things. Oh. And so like Jim is having all of these issues trying to get like this business up and running and he's away from Pam a whole lot. Uh, there's like a lot of stress and tension there. Like Pam's breaking down and there's like just this sound guy who like she never paid attention to before and mm -hmm. the audience never actually knew he was there. And then she's like, 
oh, you're a person and I kind of like you. But then like before anything actually happens, she kind of like, I don't Comes know. To her senses. I don't want to say come back to her senses, but like, yeah, like she realizes she wants to be with Jim. Yeah. That's your favorite show, isn't it? Shrek. Yeah. Oh, well, I, yeah, I have I have impeccable taste, so of course I like it. <laughs> I think it's a really good show. I, I, I never, I didn't watch it when it was first airing. Actually, within the last year, watched it, the whole entire thing. And I'm not saying it's a bad show at all. I'm saying compared to all the other seasons, 8 and 9 were very lackluster. But overall, good show. Guys, if you haven't watched The Office yet, go ahead and give it a watch. Yep. Oh, absolutely. And especially, I think, after Carell leave, you see a better dynamic between Dwight and Jim yeah. start to foster. Yeah. After he leaves, I think those are just the best seasons. Just really, that's where the cream of the crop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Let's, let's move on. <laughs> let's, let's move on. Oh, yeah. We've only touched upon, <laughs> upon like one topic, and we're like 45 minutes in. Yeah, huh? What were the other topics? We, we got said? the actual topic of, of philosophy itself. Uh, we do have the actual topic of philosophy itself. I'm excited. Oh, Christ. Because, okay. John, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's your strong suit. You know, relating back to that imposter syndrome kind of discussion, it's not feeling like a strong suit, but <laughs> it, uh, it is. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm interested to see what are people's reactions when you say you're pursuing that career course. Because mm. I feel like you might have had some interesting re reactions to that. Uh, I did. I did. I think what's curious is it, it depends on who's asking me, right? When I was an undergrad, there's kind of like two responses of like, one, they wouldn't really get it. And they would say, well, at least you get a degree or something like that. And they would just kind of move on. Or somebody would kind of like just take the piss out of me and just be like, what are you going to do with that? It's so worthless. Oh, what a very British phrase. Those don't seem like the two best options. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it seems like people are like passively aggressive about it or they're just like, fuck you. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, you know, it's the damnedest thing. But that's interesting. I've learned something over the last, like, three years that people don't like it when you really think or when you actually listen to them. Mm. That's upsetting to a lot of people. And that's what I admire about you, John. Thank you. That, that's very nice yeah, of you. Yeah, you're an excellent listener. That's why you fit right into this podcast. Yeah. I think we got lucky in the fact that I feel like I share a lot of friends, you guys included, that have this ability to kind of bring back even the most minute details of like times that we shared together and be like, oh, remember when you said this like random mm. sentence and mm -hmm. like even if it's just used as like an inside joke in the context of what we're talking about, like that's such a cool quality to have. I think it's very important for like just fostering like good relationships with people and I don't know. I mean, call me kind of like romantic, but I think the whole of life is just built on how you interact with other people. And so like being able to be really good at that is really important. So I guess like when I tell people I'm doing a master's in philosophy, now it seems to be more of a question of like, why aren't you doing a PhD? Because like a master's doesn't really do me anything extra than a, a bachelor's would. Mm -hmm. Or they'll ask like, when are you going to do a PhD or something like that? And I, I kind of just... I don't know. I think what's weird is if you actually try to have a conversation with them, like about what you want to do or why they think it's framed in that kind of way, it kind of turns them off. You know, like you can imagine when somebody's like, well, almost when anybody says, hi, how are you? Your gut instinct is to say, I'm fine. <laughs> like, yeah. move on. I, I want to yeah. talk about something else. And I think it's the same thing where they're like, why aren't you doing a PhD? And they just kind of expect me to be like, oh, I don't know. I just didn't want to. And they'd be like, yeah, whatever. I heard some sounds come out of your mouth. Now I can talk about something else. Yeah, um, I see that. But if you try to like engage, it's, it's disorienting. I've never really thought about those details before when we were just kind of conditioned to say these very template responses. Because I like throwing curveballs at people. That sounds bad, but it's true. I like throwing curveballs at people mm -hmm. all the time. And when people are like, how are you? Sometimes I just go, not happy. And it really takes them aback. And they're like, what? Yeah. what? Just, I don't know how to deal with this. Yeah. It's what? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry? Yeah, it's okay. It's not your fault. Because that is an honest response. And they don't expect... I mean, unless the honest response is like positive, if you truly give your honest answer to how are you or something like that, it's, it's off-putting. Yeah. Exactly. Or it can be anyways. Damn it, John, you're making me think. Speaking of think, this is the perfect person to talk to considering, so I don't know whether or not either of you will watch this show. There's an anime 
and it is pretty widely regarded as like a masterpiece when it comes to like a series of anime. It's called Neon Genesis Evangelion. So the reason it's, re it's regarded as a masterpiece is because yeah. whoever directed it or whoever wrote it kind of put in a lot of philosophical undertones. And I was at work yesterday and I was kind of just sitting there. I usually kind of just listen to podcasts and, and things when I'm when I'm working to pass the time and I kind of just got tired of listening to what I was. My mind drifted to Evangelion. I was like, you know what? I didn't really understand that show because the first couple episodes, primarily they're just really action oriented. It's really just zippy zippy zoom, good animation and it makes you feel good. But come the last like three episodes, shit just gets really trippy. And unless you're analyzing it and you walk, go into it with that mindset, you're not gonna pick up on anything. It's gonna just be like, what the fuck is happening? And then there's also oh, yeah. movies that go along with it. But anyways, the long and short of what I'm trying to bring up is the final kind of scene in one of the movies has to do with the main character strangling uh, one of his like compatriots in this big battle. Like, And they've gone through all this hardship and it kind of ends. And it's one of those scenes where you think they'd kind of just be happy and like, oh, we finally did it. This is a touching moment. But it ends up going really dark and he ends up killing her and strangling her. And so there's this huge, oh, like, God. discussion on, you know, what the fuck? This was out of the left field. Why did he do this? And so my question to you and what people have come up with is that prior to that happening, there was this whole world takeover thing where everyone on the planet Earth became one unified being. And it was the reason behind doing mm. that would take away all semblance of, like, pain and suffering and emotions. And if we all became this one unified thing, there would just be no pain in the world. And so the main character ends up making the decision that, no, I'd rather have people have their own identities and have pain and suffering because at least it would be my own. It wouldn't be chosen for me. Mm. So he revives everyone, everyone comes back. And so the discussion that they had was, okay, he kills her to prove that he exists. And it ends up going to this discussion of like, you can't prove that you exist if you're alone. You require other human beings to prove your own existence. And that made no sense to me. Oh uh, yeah, boy. <laughs> boy. <laughs> Whole boy. Hot dog. Yeah. Um, there's like three or four things in that last little mm -hmm. bit that kind of like jump out, right? So like the first is that idea of like everyone kind of becomes one being. Mm -hmm. Initially, I kind of thought you meant like almost like a Power Rangers, like Megazord kind of thing where like everyone just glommed together. Right. What you meant was something like almost like spiritually or mentally. Right. Something like that, right? right? Mm -hmm. Very similar to the Vulcans. And I think like there's, I don't know, like it's kind of curious about what that means to become one being. I have some reservations about how that kind of happens. There's that issue. And then there's the point about like, you only kind of understand yourself with the relation of somebody else. Mm -hmm. And the guy murdering somebody else to prove that he exists, something like yeah. that. So like, it seems like there's those three kind of points. Yeah. Right. And I guess in backwards order, I definitely think that like, I don't know if it has to be murder necessarily, but I do think that you only kind of affirm your existence by action, right? And like in, in a weird kind of way, just because of the type of beings that we are, like just because like we have a physical body, we don't really have a choice but to act. So like you can kind of imagine like if you're like super depressed and you try to stay in bed all night and like all day and for days on end, it might look as if you're not choosing to get out of bed, but actually you're just kind of choosing to stay in bed. Like you're choosing to not make a choice, which is a choice in itself. Mm. Yeah, I kind of buy the idea that you affirm your existence by action. And then it seems to move to this other kind of idea of like, well, really what he's proving is not that like his body exists, but like his individuality outside of like that group. Mm. So like I took a class last term on Heidegger, who writes a lot about kind of like authenticity and trying to like be individual and unique kind of person instead of just doing what everyone else does. And one of the things that I really kind of picked up on that is this idea that like in one way you define yourself with both what you do but also kind of like your relation to what you're doing. Like some kids think that to be like a punk or like a cool kid, they have to like ride skateboards, mm. but that doesn't make them cool kids. But like the cool kids actually like riding skateboards and dress however they want to dress. So it's the relation to the activity, right? Right. It sounds like he kind of murders the woman saying like, well, no, look, I am different from the crowd. And in so doing, like my relationship to the action kind of changes or something mm. like. Yeah, my, my individuality is, is assured by if for example he was still part of like the hive being you know committing such a heinous mm. act would be I, don't know, I guess impossible or something so maybe by committing this one last act of terror he ends up affirming that 
I don't know. It's it, it, that's why I brought it up. But like I had such a hard time wrestling with it. And I was just like, what? Why? Yeah, I think what's crazy is I think there's a really compelling argument that kind of says like, just as we're born, right? And like just as we kind of grow up, we understand the world through kind of like the everyone or something like. We're not like born with the sense of like individuality. You're just born and you just see people say like, oh yeah, peanut butter and jelly is just good. It's not good for you. It's not good for these people. It's just, it's just what we do. And we take baths and we watch TV and that's just what we do as people, right? Right. And then later in life, you start to have kind of the sense of like, oh no, it's me, myself. I am able to oppose this other kind of stuff. And I think there's some arguments that would say like, you don't actually escape the everyone you don't actually escape like that one being that everyone kind of merges into while that guy like tries to murder the girl to like prove his individuality i kind of sit there and i'm like what do you think it would be like to be an individual how could you make an individual intelligible outside of referencing like everything Mm. else and i think the moment you start making that reference you get into kind of gray waters of is it really an individual because it wants to be, or is it an individual because it's specifically trying to not be these other things? And that doesn't feel like that free either. Right. Everything is relational. I mean, it's a relative. Everything is relative. The only way you're able to describe something that's different, like if you don't have anything to compare it to, then it's not different. It just starts to feel nonsensical. Yeah. Like you can kind of think of like phrases like bigger and faster only make sense if you're comparing two things that have size Mm. or that have speed. It doesn't make any sense for me to say something like, the square is bigger than yellow. Yeah. (laughs) Makes no sense. And so likewise, I think the idea of an individual only makes sense in the context of a universal. Quick shout out to Hegel and the dialectic. Go pick up your copy of the phenomenology. It's real fire right now. Oh man, he actually referenced me. Yo, yeah. (laughs) Is that guy still around? No, Hegel died like the early mid 1800s. Yeah, that's what I thought. (laughs) We need to do a reverse time capsule. Yeah, but I rep my shit. (laughs) What up, Hegel? (laughs) You and the gymnasium were pretty tight. I've been with you since the old days. I like the idea of this philosopher in the 1800s (laughs) listening to this podcast now (laughs) and just going, what the hell is an anime? <laughs> what are they talking about? Yes. I have no idea what the yeah what the fuck is this shad roulette? What is an anime? I'm glad that Gage got some boobs though. <laughs> oh no, we didn't yes. record that oh, part right. on the that's podcast. Okay. All right. Well, that was a heavy topic. Quickly turned bit juvenile, but. I enjoy it. Oh, oh, actually, somewhat shortly. I think one thing that kind of like follows how John Claude was describing the show, what's it called again? Neon Genesis Evangelion, or just Evangelion. So like, the way you had described it was like, the first few episodes are kind of like pretty cool and vanilla and like they're easy to sink in. And then if you don't like really kind of pay attention to everything, the last three or four episodes really start to like blow your mind and it's really confusing and nothing really kind of makes sense. Mm-hmm. One thing that I noticed just from my own experience over the last six months was like, at a certain point, I started to feel like I was sounding crazy when I would talk to people that were not in the philosophy program. Because I would start saying phrases like, hey, look, man, you know, like up and down are really the same if you're transcending. (laughs) And they're like, what the fuck does that even mean anymore? What kind of person are you, right? Or just like... There's this beautiful guy, Gabriel Marcel. Shout out, Marcel. You my boy. Heidegger got shit on you. When'd he die? That's sad, Gage, but yeah, he's he's dead too. He's dead too. I thought this was some guy in your class that you're like, there's this beautiful guy. Shout out, Marcel. (laughs) No, I'm just going to keep shouting out my favorite philosophers. Yeah, Marcel died in in the 70s. So Marcel, I was reading like one of his journals and he has this phrase called transdescendent instead of transcendence of like going above and beyond and surpassing your upper limits and stuff like that Mm -hmm. transdescendence is obviously like i've gone below rock bottom (laughs) like somehow i've surpassed what i thought my limits were as far as like being a piece of shit (laughs) i've just gone so far down and i just think that's a beautiful word it's a beautiful word it deserves to be remembered in time oh i love it it's nice and chocolate-coated in this podcast. Yeah. Oh, man, I thought the worst it could get was me being homeless. 
Turns out, mm. exterminating an entire <laughs> race was as bad as it gets. <laughs> Not, I didn't mean to do that. Grants descendants. <laughs> yes. Aw, oh, guys, I didn't mean to exterminate an entire race. I'm sorry. Oh, this is a really bad day for me, guys. I just... <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> oh. Did I do that? Did Urkel do that? <laughs> Jaleel White. Did I? I, I can't believe I knew his name, but it's Jaleel White. He was also the voice of Sonic. An exterminator of all races. Motherfucker. Brilliant. <laughs> Do we want to go on to our next topics, or I, I don't know how much time you have, John. Uh, I might go have a birthday dinner. I don't know. I, I, I'm starting to smell things. <laughs> I'm starting to smell things in the kitchen. Okay, well, why don't we touch on the two other topics really, really, really All right, really let's quickly. do it, let's do it. Yeah. International travel. John, you are all the way in England. You are our first guest that we brought over from the other side of the globe. Oh, uh, yeah. I got to tell you right now, it feels really cool to do that, too. Yeah, man. It feels so cool. Yeah. So how has that changed you? How has that affected your life, being separated from the great U.S. of A? Yeah, so quick little context. Last year, I was living in Edinburgh, Scotland. And this year, I'm living in Colchester, England, which is like an hour east of London. And so... It's been somewhat of like a choice time to be out of the States because obviously last year was the Brexit vote about the referendum of leaving the EU. And this current year obviously is the 2016 election and the inauguration and whatever else. And so it's been somewhat interesting being to a certain extent outside of the bubble of what I experienced in Tallahassee. But also I feel like I kind of took advantage of this title of like the international guy. Because let's be real, me living in England is not like a culture shock. You know what I mean? Like, No, you're not in like Thailand or anything. Yeah, like here's the biggest thing I, I've noticed in the last two years being out of the States. Has it really been two years? Yeah. Well, I mean, like I left not this recent October, but the one before that. You left around the time I did, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. I think so. It was the same time frame. But yeah, I mean, like things close earlier. I'm very upset that I think one thing that I miss is that no matter what time it is in the States, I can buy a TV and get my tires changed and have a coffee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just can. You know what I mean? And here, once it's like six or seven o'clock, you cannot buy a coffee anywhere. Like places just close. Um, God. Yeah, it's bullshit. Like I remember going to Waffle House like drunk as fuck at four in the morning. Shout out to Waffle House. They're there. Shout out to Waffle House. Y'all took care of me for four years between 2010 and 2014. Thank you. I could not have got my FSU degree without you. Word up to the double waffle. Double waffle. The waffle waffle. I miss you, Stacy, on Capital Circle Northwest. You are a really great waitress. She's probably dead, too. Oh, my God. <laughs> Stacy passed away. In, like Marcel, Stacy died in 1849. Stacy passed away after, after she came back from the singularity and was promptly strangled <laughs> next to a Waffle House. Do you think she was, like, waiting tables one day, and she went to John's table, and he just wasn't there anymore, and she had a heart attack? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. I think of the same vein. I just want to give a big word up to Whataburger on Tennessee Ave. Y'all definitely fed me a few times walking back from campus way late at night. Shout out to Taco Bell. Y'all definitely fed me way more than, like, I probably shouldn't be alive. <laughs> kind of feel like Keith Richards right now, but I, I got Taco Bell in my blood and, instead of cocaine and heroin. <laughs> I mean, McDonald's, like, you just McDonald's. You know what you do. I like that. You do you, McDonald's. You do you. Big up to McDonald's. <laughs> but up, 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 motherfucker. <laughs> Speaking of coffee, I sort of went through with straws when I was in London. I want to say summer of 2014, because that's the time I decided to quit coffee. Mm. For a brief period of time, I quit coffee, and I was just, like, shaking and tired all the time. It was bad. I'm like, I'm going to switch over to tea and be more healthy. By the time I got back, I'm like, fuck this. Oh. Time for coffee. Put mm. creamer in there. Absolutely. Put a little sugar. I was going to say, did you come mm. out clean on the other side like Andy Dufresne, or you just came out covered in no, shit? No, I... <laughs> like Andy Dufresne? <laughs> yeah, from Shawshank, dig. No, he did not come out clean, though. Yeah, he did. It's the metaphor. No. That's what Morgan Freeman said. He's like, he just waded through miles of shit and came out clean on the other side. <laughs> no, no, no. I waded through miles of shit, and then I ended up right back and in the prison. And ended up covered in That's shit. That's what happened. <laughs> also, mm. John, final question. Yeah. 
you work as a barista, correct? Correct, correct. And so how has that changed your perspective on coffee? Oh, uh, dude, so I guess what's really cool is like throughout my time at uni, I really wanted to be a barista and I just had other jobs and I didn't want to lose those jobs. And so I, I kind of just kept putting it off. And so when I moved to Edinburgh, I just kind of thought like, you know, this is the year where I'm not really doing anything. I'll start school next year, this current year. So this is the year for me to either be a barista or a bartender. I always wanted to do one of those two jobs. So yeah, I, I got a job at the, the cafe and it was really just a stroke of dumb luck. I mean, if we're being honest, white, tall, skinny dude, white privilege that I just happened to luck into a really great cafe. Dude, we just lost our, all of our Tumblr audience. I'm owning up to it. Oh, they're white. Oh, never mind. <laughs> the white, unsubscribe. Well, we could debate white identity, which is not a thing that people do. But yeah, yes, I was fortunate enough to work at, for real, like one of the top three or four cafes in all of Scotland called Artisan Roast. Uh, yeah, I was able to like just learn a shit ton about the corpus of just coffee chemistry and like the effect of the altitude of the beans growing upon like the flavor profile to like how they're picked and roasting and washing and like grind size, how many bars of pressure like you should have for an espresso, everything about brewing. What's really good about like the methodology and like the theory behind how you should be stretching the milk for like lattes and things like that. It was fascinating and it changed everything like there's that scene from pulp fiction they show up at tarantino's house and he's drinking a, a cup of yeah. coffee and that they, they offer it to john travolta and he's like damn jimmy that's good coffee and he's like shut the fuck up i know it's good fucking coffee that's why i buy the colombian shit because i know it's good coffee it got to a point where like i was really having just the best coffee i could imagine like i, I would have these recipes down pat of 19 and a half 20 grams that i'm gonna grind to this kind of fineness and the water is gonna be 90 degrees and we're gonna let it bloom, you know, for 30 seconds. Then we're gonna fill it up to the rest of the way of the AeroPress, do this inverted, whatever kind of thing over two minutes and 30 seconds. It was like really, it was awesome. And the saddest thing about me coming down to Colchester is that there is not really a specialty cafe here and I don't have all of the equipment to do it myself. If there's any of you, what are they called? Like Kickstarters, if there's a GoFundMe <laughs> out there, that's looking to buy me 30 pound coffee grinder. I'm in. That's not how fundraisers work. You got to start the fundraiser. Give him a nice conical grinder. Yeah, it's got to be a ceramic burr. Yeah, ceramic burr coffee. I'll write you a term paper. Grinder, it, it, so it actually grinds it and doesn't just, you know, cut them up. Preach. Nice even fineness. So, you know, you don't, you don't get little dust and then big chunky ones, you know. Well, yeah, you need proper exposure. If you have uneven like surface area on your grounds, don't step to me. Don't step to me. You gotta get out of <laughs> yeah, here with that shit. Exactly. I'm not trying to have that. That's fascinating. Because normally I'm just content with any black cup of coffee. I'm like, all right, I'll drink this. That's fascinating how much like artistry you put into it and craft. Because I just have a care rig. Yeah, uh, one, you should definitely get rid of that. You should get rid of that. I will personally buy you an AeroPress. 200 filters and you will just instantly have better coffee gauge. I'm telling you. I'm telling you right now. Huh. All right. Yep. Yeah, I gotta try that. I've been wanting to try French presses for a while. Yeah, so that, like, I mean, a French press is good. It, I think French press is good if you're trying to make like a, a quantity, larger quantities of coffee. Mm -hmm. I, I just think AeroPress gives you a little bit more finesse. And because it, like just the volume tends to be smaller, you end up making less coffee, which helps you actually kind of limit the amount of caffeine and coffee that you take. Huh. that like you intake. And this part's actually mildly important as a health PSA. It's just not good for you to drink coffee within the first like two hours of waking up. Really? Not only like physically, but it doesn't give you that caffeine boost that you're looking for. Cause I, I, I so poop like crazy after that. <laughs> Why is it not good for you? So when you wake up, your body has a natural level of cortisol mm -hmm. just in virtue of it, you know, just becoming awake. And so when you drink coffee, the caffeine, like your body recognizes, oh, we have this amount of caffeine, we are able to cut back on the cortisol levels. And so the caffeine's not actually being that effective, right? Like your body lowers the cortisol that it's producing to actually wake you up. So it just balances out. Yeah, well, your body will just start producing far less cortisol. Mm. And so, so mm. not only will the coffee not wake you up, but you will just start waking up more tired because you had not had coffee yet. 
You know what I mean? Oh, like, okay. Oh man, maybe maybe huh. that explains why yeah. I've been waking up. I, I just recently have been trying to get myself on a more regular sleep schedule. And mm. so I've just been stricter with myself in terms of like, this is the time that my body needs to adjust to go to bed. This is the time that I need to wake up. I'm, I'm hoping that it affects my mood and maybe I need to decide whether or not to, to cut out the morning coffee. We will see. We will see, we will see. Yeah, man, I guess my rule of thumb is like, I wake up at like say 6.30 or seven mm -hmm. and I tend to like try to not have a coffee until you know 8.30 or nine, something like that. It's not like you are not allowed to have a coffee at any point in the morning but like the number of years that i would like kind of wake up and go to the kitchen and like pour a cup of coffee that's not the way to do it mm. it's effectively like you'd get the same effect if you just had hot water interesting also regarding the same kind of thing so your body has when it goes to sleep your body produces serotonin and it kind of kind of induces that kind of sleepiness for you and it helps you fall asleep and also when your body's waking up along with the cortisol it also releases dopamine to kind of help you increase alertness mm -hmm. and make you wake up and so if you're lying in bed and you do that thing where you just kind of constantly hit the snooze button you end up start getting those systems confused so like you hit the snooze button and your body's like okay it's time to go back to sleep so it produces serotonin and then your alarm goes off again so it produces dopamine to wake you back up but then you're like ah oh, snooze again that can really screw with your sleep cycles too yeah this fitbit that i have on has been really psyching me out because it tracks my sleep and like some nights i get like nine hours of sleep and other nights i get like five mm. Yeah, that's not healthy, is it? Irregular sleep cycles is not, not the best. Yeah, I, I don't want to tell you how to live your life, Cage, but you're living it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an excellent point to go to our final exactly, thoughts. Exactly, yes. <laughs> so, Gage, in rebuttal, what are your final thoughts? <laughs> Apparently, I've been living my life the wrong way, and i got to get and, coffee. And a little bit later and get rid of my care right to be clear the philosophy guy that doesn't really believe in firm answers or like binary questions just says like yeah it's just flat wrong <laughs> there's, there's no ambiguity <laughs> and we rarely get that on our podcast too <laughs> i always like to think we open it up to discussion but you're like nope shut it down you're wrong, wrong. Yeah, that's, in your life wrong yeah boom Shout out to cortisol, shout out to dopamine. Shout out to cortisol, shout out to dopamine, serotonin, you guys, you're doing it right. God, especially mm. serotonin, man. Mm. I love that stuff. You got me. We're gonna get sponsored, I know it. Okay, what about you, John Schmick? What are your final thoughts? Final thoughts, okay, here are my thoughts, right? I think there's something curious about the 20th century French philosophy that has a tendency towards grounding philosophy in like the lived experience. You see a lot of like German idealists start to like get really abstract and the same thing happens with the post-structuralists, but like they start to get really abstract and away from like actual lived experience. But the French have a unique way, whether it be Gabriel Marcel or Rancière or Foucault, they have a tendency of like going back and saying, well, look, here's a whole bunch of factual lived data and here's how I personally live my life. Here's what I'm able to deduce from that. And I just think that's sweet. And they have a really great play on words. So as a man that loves puns and as a man that loves real life, thank you, French philosophy. Dude, next time you're on, we should talk about puns because <laughs> yeah. I love those. Yeah. That went great last it time. Did. I'm happy that's what you took away from my final <laughs> thought. Yeah, I, I know. You're like, French philosophy, <laughs> these great names. Dude, I love puns. <laughs> That's the kind of shit where like, I feel like if you showed up at one of our lectures, you would just be like, hey, do you know that guy's name was Georg? <laughs> <laughs> I would totally do that. I'd be like, dude, this reminds me of the end of the Pokemon, the first movie. And they're like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. when Ash turned to stone and all the Pokemon start crying, that's sort of like what you're talking about, right? It's damn close. It's damn close, Gage. <laughs> I'll probably be banned from the country. Okay, John Claude, what are your final thoughts? <laughs> Brief final thought. I'm just interested when John goes back and listens to this episode, what he would have wished he would have added to his own conversation. I think that'll be an interesting. Mm, more shout outs. Shout outs to John Schmick for coming on the episode today. Ah, my boy. Yeah, thanks, man. We've been trying to get you on for a while and I'm glad we've got it down pat. Oh, also one extra final thought. I told Dodge that I'm currently remixing the theme song that he made for you guys. 
mainly because I just want to fuck with him. That's really all this yeah. is. I don't like Dodge having anything nice because his whole life is idyllic for me. <laughs> if I could just like put a thorn in his shoe and say like, ha ha, that song you had on our friend's podcast, I took that from you for an episode, then my life will be a little bit more bright. I'll make you a deal. If you remix it by the time this podcast airs, we'll put it at the end of the podcast and Deal. it will be on the front of all of our podcasts from here on out. Ooh. Oh, God. Shout out to Gage for being a good host. Thanks, man. Shout out to John claude <laughs> Shout out to John claude <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, turns out I was dead the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of a better way to end that. <laughs> Boom.